Now we're going to do a little detour from the main path into what seems to be a Wild West world of what some people would say hacking. But we will discover maybe it's not hacking. Maybe be sort of the, the point of this detour. Oh, Mr. Lipkin. Uh, no, no, you can, you could come. That's all right. We all, we have been waiting. Look, do not deprive me of innocent merriment at your expense. So, there is no malice. I just need to tease some. It used to be Ryan, now it's you. So, uh, OK. So there is this algorithm, Euclid algorithm, right? And Euclid worked on it, and Pythagoras maybe worked on it, and Gauss worked on it, and Euler worked on it, right? So, so everybody worked on it. So you assume that you couldn't do better. Nobody ever thought that you could do better, because this is canonical algorithm on which the entire edifice of number theory is based and things like that. But there was a young Israeli student, physics. Physicists are fearless. If they need to do something, they'll go and do it. And this, by the way, quote of his letter to me. So you're privileged to, to know stuff nobody else in the world knows. So there was this kid in 1961. He had an advisor who told him that you have to do, uh, write this program and run it. And they had only two hours a week on this computer. There's, according to him, there's one computer in Israel which they could use. There was many people who wanted to use it. And in order to do what they were doing, they needed to do rational arithmetic. Physicists occasionally need rational arithmetic, apparently. And uh, there is something called Raka algebras. I have no idea what it is, but his advisor was this guy called Raka, who invented this algebras. So he had to do what he had to do. And this Raka algebras required rational arithmetic. And rational arithmetic requires greatest common divisor. Why? Because you see, you need to reduce them. Otherwise, the P and Q will get bigger, bigger, and bigger. Equality will become harder, harder, and harder. So you need to reduce them. You reduce them by GC, using GCD. Right? You should have learned it in about fourth grade, I think. So this guy, Joseph Stein, was pressed. It was either not finishing his thesis and dropping out of school or inventing some way of doing GCD which would work because Euclid wouldn't work for him. It was way too slow because Euclid depends on Brian. You could move to your thing. That's all right. So, uh, so uh, remainder was very slow. By the way, remainder is still very slow. So, so if it's not that things improved. Remain, but computers were much slower. So in his case, it was if you just use remainder, you don't fit into a two-hour slot, and you never finish your PhD. So he had to sort of, as he said, fast GCD meant survival. And it really, for him, meant survival. So this kid invents a totally new GCD algorithm. And as we shall see, a deep one. So let us see what he invented, Joseph Stein, in 1961. By the way, the amazing thing, and that's how we, I started sort of exchanging letters with the guy, is that I found out that Knuth, when he describes the algorithm, says that it was invented in 1961, but then quotes a paper which was published in 1967. So why the gap? So 
another thing I learned from, from him, so I found him out. He's a wonderful guy. He was sort of very humble and wonderful. Just uh, I, One thing, he refused to, to give me his picture because I wanted to put in this slide his picture. But he said that my algorithm is in the public domain, but my face is not, <laughs> which I, I think it's a wonderful class. I mean, very nice guy. So apparently, uh, he's this Raka guy of Raka algebra, was not very encouraging. And only when he found another boss, that new boss, much, much later, five years later, encouraged him to publish it. Which was, again, a wonderful thing because, as I will try to illustrate, it's not just a very fast algorithm, it's a deep one. So let us look at the mathematics which leads to Stein algorithm. First of all, obviously, GCD of n and 0 is n. This, I mean, you know, not, not very deep fact. Then GCD of n and n is n. Everybody agrees with that? Then GCD of two, two even numbers is two times GCD of half of these numbers. Yeah? Then GCD of even number and odd number is you could just shift the even number. Remember that division is expensive. Shifts are fast. Division by two, for those of you who don't know, is actually shift. Uh, by the way, finding the remainder dividing by two is also fast. You don't need a remainder. You just need to mask the last bit. So if you have even number, odd number, you know what to do. If you're odd number, even number, you do what you do. I mean, the same thing. And then if you have two odd numbers, one of them is greater than the other, yes? Because if they are equal, we are covered. We know what to do. We just return. If you have two odd numbers, you could always get them to odd number, and even number which will shift, right? So if you subtract the bigger odd number from the smaller odd number, right? No, pardon me. You will subtract the smaller from the bigger, yes? So that's the idea. So let's write the code. Well, before we write the code, that's we're running the algorithm, sort of. First, we get the first two out, and the third column just keeps the two. Because there will be no other twos. First, you factored out twos from that point on. You never, you never get, get any more twos to contribute. And then you do this, this thing, and you get, get GCD. Right? I don't want to read it line by line, guys. Let us look at the algorithm. So, uh, by the way, the question is, what are binary integers? Binary integers are like integers is a concept which says, I'm like an integer, except you could have fast shift and you could find whether I'm even or odd in the fast way. Binary integers. So this is the first sort of part, preamble, not, nothing much. What we say that let us swap uh, negative numbers, make them positive. Because you see, otherwise we'll be doing way too much work shifting. Because small negative numbers look like huge big binary numbers, so we, we're just shifting. And this is, you know, does not affect the outcome. So uh, then we do simple things. So 
if if one of them is zero, we just return the other. So these are guards. So this is not this is not an interesting piece of code, but we have to do what we have to do. So at that point, we know that both m and n are greater than zero. Right? Because they're not zero, they're not negative, we're done. Yes? Simple. Then we factor out powers of 2. And here we do it in the following way. We factor all the powers of 2 from m. The code should be self-evident that while it's even, keep shifting. and incrementing. And some people ask, why do you use int? Why? Well, I actually don't care because, you see, I don't believe this number is going to get too large because this is a bounded by a log. So I think that, you know, 2 to the 32 is a perfectly good bound on the length of your number. That's the number of bits. I don't think we will often use binary integers with more than 2 to the 32 bits. Just so. So this int is perfectly fine. I don't need to be generic there. 2 to the 31, OK, this is good too. So Tom, you know, he always wants to be precise. OK, 2 to the 31. So it's a. Fairly conservative, but okay. So we factor out all twos on one, all twos on the other. So we know that they're both odd. Yes, very simple. So factoring out, and then the main loop. I decided to to write it, and so I could have squashed it in one. But I think since there's a different sort of logic, separating slides is actually good. And the main loop is that while they're not equal, we're going to drive them down until they become equal. What do we do? If n is greater than m, we will swap. Strange. Otherwise, what we do, we subtract. And get rid, we know now that m is even. Why do we know that it's even? Because both of them were odd. And odd number minus odd number gives us even number. So this is why instead of while we do do while, I don't want to check the first time. I know that it's even. Right? So it's clearly even at that point. So I shift. Now I need to check. And I keep checking, and when it becomes, so when I get out, I know that both of them are still odd and equal, because that's the only way we're going to get out of the thing. So how many times are we going to, through this loop? At most, as many times as we have one bit in both, minus two. Minus the last bit, which obviously you don't shift. So this is a logarithmic algorithm. So if it's bounded by the number of ones in, 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 the, in the thing, we shift. To get. And then what do we return? You see, we need to take mean of these two things. And then we shift up. I think it's beautiful, guys. It's absolutely beautiful. So here comes the very, very important point, however. The point which, which, which sort of forces me so all those people say, so why do I mean, it's just a hack. People who need to do it will find it in Knuth. By the way, it's false. People can never find anything in Knuth. Finding things in Knuth requires linear traversal. 
sort of, and highly recommend it. I have done it several times and discovered many jokes. But finding is not easy. So, but there is a very profound lesson, which I'm going to repeat several times today. What's the lesson? There are no such things as good hex. Right? This is a beautiful algorithm. Therefore, it's not a hex. Therefore, there is something profound about it. We have to sit and study and think. What should we think about? Could it be generalized? Is it just binary integers? Is it just an accident of fate that our computers are binary, not ternary? And remember, Russians tried to building, uh, building a ternary computer called Saturn. It's in Knut, if you do linear traversal you'll find mention of this famous, I mean, three is a much better base for gate construction. You get the, actually, the best, the minimal number of gates if you have arithmetic based on E. But that's hard, there are some other issues there. <laughs> so, the best base in terms of number of gates is as close to E as possible. And 3 is closer to E than 2. So in terms of gate reduction, 3 based based computers are actually optimal. And in Russia, they tried building such a computer and succeeded. Except apparently, minimizing number of gates in your processor is not the only goal. And the sort of negative factors of base 3 sort of made this design not very interesting. Uh, at the same time, by the way, many American computer scientists were working on threshold logic, which was also sort of allow you multiple sort of non-binary non -binary things. And you could also do wonderful things. Nobody does it anymore. So, you know, in some sense, the fact that we have binary computers wasn't deterministic. In the 50s, it wasn't clear. There were people who were claiming we should build decimal computers, right? Because binary coded decimal was very, very common sort of representation of integers, saying we, we cannot afford spending all this time converting from binary to decimal. So ternary computers and things like that. But so it seems to be an accident of fate that we have these binary computers, and this clearly works just for binary, or does it? That is the question which one should always ask, sort of trying to, to get deep. You, you don't just write code, but you have to sort of stop and think. And maybe two years after you thought, you, you think again. Because, you know, you don't get it the first time. So let us look at this algorithm and try to see how we could go about sort of making it as wonderful as Euclid algorithm. And what is wonderful about Euclid algorithm is that we discovered that it works in all kinds of different domains. Yes? So this is, I already told you that sort of every useful program is a worthy object of study. Sort of, this is some people, or they do not attend my class, they say, oh, Alex is this ivory tower guy. He doesn't want to look at real problems. This is false, guys. I might be an ivory tower guy, but I do want to look at real problems. But I want to get deep into them. Right? I, I claim that for every thing in, say, our engine, which does something useful, there is something profound there. It's either bad or there is something prof profound. If you see, there is this dichotomy. And it's worth studying. Real code is wonderful. Not that it's wonderful, it's ugly and terrible very often. But it could be turned, should be turned into something wonderful. It's the same imperative as in Hilbert's we shall know, we must know. It's, it's we must strive to get to deep into what, what it does. So uh, let us go through. We, we went through, uh, but let's just quickly go through how generalization of Euclid happened. First, there were Greeks. They were using it 
for line segments or line segments which are integer-like, right? Then Stanion makes enormous breakthrough. The algorithm works for polynomials. He realizes that polynomials can be viewed as a data, not just a procedure, and invents algebra of polynomials and shows that polynomials allow you to do Euclid algorithm. Then Gauss, who hates the algorithm, is forced to admit it with Gaussian integer. Then Dirichlet, Dedekind discover that it works for all other kind of things. And then eventually generic version by Noether in around 1930. I suspect she knew it about 1921. But the book by Van der Waarden came in 1930. So long time, long time. But eventually we get the, this generic abstract version. Now, let us see if we could speed up history. If we could take Stein's algorithm and go through the same path faster. Apparently, we could, because we did. You know, in a sense, it did happen. The first step, which took here 2,000 years, took less than two years. In 1969, Knuth knew, I cannot tell you who invented it. I know that Knuth knew about it in 1969. Remember, it's published in 1967. In 1969, Knuth knows that it could be used for polynomials. You say, well, polynomials, I mean, they don't have even an odd. Polynomials are with real numbers. How could you do it? But it's absolutely brilliant. Somehow, you could use x the way we use 2. You see, we say that we determine if a polynomial is divisible by x, if it has no free coefficient, we call him even in terms of our algorithm. If it has something like 1 or 3 or pi at the end, we call it odd. Yes? Do not despair. We'll see in a second how it all works. So we'll just call it. Mathematicians don't call it even odd, but we will. And then we have an operation called shift. But how do we shift? Well, we shift by dividing by x. Observe that in our Stein algorithm, we don't shift everything. We only shift even numbers. Only when the zero at the end. So we will shift only even polynomials. And then we need to understand one essential thing, that if you have two odd polynomials over real numbers, over rationals would work too, over a field, we could cancel the coefficient. We could multiply them by some constant. So to equalize, well, we multiply 1 by a constant to make its free coefficient equal to the coefficient of the other one. And then we subtract. So we make 1 even. And we keep going and going and going and going. This one let us do carefully. So this example, unlike the previous example, I want to go by line by line to assure that you see it. Right? So first of all, do you agree with the first line? Yeah. Oh, no. it's the, same. the second line is the same, the same mathematics as before. Now, the mathematics becomes very simple. If you have two polynomials divisible by x, factor x out. If you have one polynomial divisible by x, another one not, you could just get rid of this x. So you get rid of it. 
and the other way around. Now, if you have two polynomials which are not divisible by x, that's the final case. The degree of 1, it's either going to be greater or equal, or it's going to be less. It's known as excluded middle, either here or there. So let's pick this one. So what do we do? We have one polynomial, which is xp plus constant. So it's not divisible by x. And another polynomial, xq plus constant, not divisible by x. What do we do? We multiply first polynomial by c over d. What happens that the free, uh, the, the, sort of one will say, it's, it's the, you, you get cancellation, right? And you keep going. By the way, reducing the degree. It, every time you reduce the degree. So the Euclidean norm, if you are, Euclidean algebraic norm gets reduced. Right? Let's look now sort of what would be the next natural step. The next natural step would be to see, well, next natural step is let's see how it really happens. Two polynomials, s cubed 3x, 2x, square minus 4, yes? So at first, what do we do? Our operation is we get them, we get m so that its free coefficient, 4, becomes 2. How do we do it? By multiplying by 1 half. Right? And then we subtract it from n. So we subtract, and we get, so in any case, two cancels. And uh, and we factor out x. So we do shift of n. Our shift is factoring out x. We drop to x square minus half x minus 3, and x squared minus 4. So now we need to do multiply by 0.75x. Uh, and I think the same thing applies. I need lost parentheses. Uh, and then it, it gets to this, x squared. Uh, quarter of x squared minus half of x. Here I could normalize. I could multiply it, the n polynomial by 4 and gets x squared. Multiplication by a constant is free because two polynomials multiplied by a constant is the same polynomial, same root, same everything. So we do sh normalize and then uh, shift. We get rid of x. So we get x minus 2. We get x squared minus 4. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I am very consistent. Observe that. <laughs> sort of parentheses are missing everywhere. Well, so uh, shift and whatever. We, we, we got it. So you understand the algorithm even if you don't agree with my parentheses, and you shouldn't. Uh, so it actually works. This is the remarkable sort of thing, that somehow the same algorithm works not just for binary integers, but for binary integers and polynomials over a field. By the way, it's not just real numbers. It's any field. It will work. Now. The next step was quite 
remarkable and it took roughly speaking uh, 30 years. Uh, that Andrea Weilert demonstrated that it works for Gaussian integers. And here, let me tell you, I mean, if you, the first version of this lecture goes back to, uh, my, my lecture, goes back to 1997. Slides are on the web. So it's not that I'm saying it. And I was saying that it will be sort of Stein algorithm will be extended to go beyond Euclid algorithm. I didn't extend it, but within two years, somebody extended it to Gaussian integers, uh, which made me quite happy. How did he do it? Again, let me go back to polynomials. As with binary integers, division by two is faster than general division, right? With polynomials, division by x is much easier than general division of polynomials. It's just a shift. It's literally a shift, right? This polynomial is just a sequence of coefficients. You shift it by one, you get rid of the, the last one, right? And the general remainder for polynomials is much harder than remainder divided by x which is, again, just the last coefficient, just the free coefficient. Right? So these operations are fundamentally cheaper. And the same thing holds for Gaussian integers. That is, general division of two Gaussian integers is much harder than division by 1 plus i. Let us see why. Here, I actually couldn't resist and stuck some non-trivial mathematics, one line, uh, here. So let's see how it, we divide by 1 plus i. You see, to divide a, i missing, i missing here, some, another bug. Uh, you, you remember? Three bugs already. So a plus b i, we, so we multiply both sides. Well, it eventually bug fixes itself. I reappears, but whatever. So uh, we multiply both uh, numerator and denominator by i plus uh, 1 minus i. We could do that, right? What happens? Well, this is 2. And this is just a plus b, and this is a minus b. So we are replacing, we don't need to do anything other than plus, minus, and shift. No, I, I is there. I is there. If you, if you multiply here, you get 1 times a, a, i times b, uh, uh, minus i times b, i, plus b, and the same way, I mean, right? So, now, here I, you know, I try not to make mistakes, except when I make them, so, uh, <laughs> this is correct, because that's the result I want. So, I, I knew what, what to get. So, it's a very, very simple, it's very efficient. You don't need to do any divisions. And it's, it's, it's the, the wonderfully easy way to check whether you're divisible or not. If A is equal to B more 2, then you're divisible. If you're either both even or both odd, which is very simple test. Now. So, and then there is this wonderful thing which happens with the remainders. So if, how does it go?
right and at least one of them one of these guys you need to correctly pick one of this because while not all of them are going to reduce the norm one of them will so you have to pick the right one right so and apparently Weilert did experiments and it makes it faster considerably faster this stuff is important in computer algebra so uh, all right so now we need to, to make one more step sort of how long will it take to make one more step and here I have to tell you again this is a personal story but it's quite remarkable the next time I give this lecture is in University of Copenhagen in 2004 I think 2004 and uh, I'm invited to give a long lecture it's like five-hour lecture on this stuff so I give this lecture and at the end I say well and I hope that somebody will show that this algorithm works even in cases Euclid algorithm doesn't work that it will work in broader classes of problems say I and then there is a break it's this infinite lecture with several breaks so I go get coffee and the guy comes to me and he says you know you might not know it but six months ago you know my advisor and I published this paper where we demonstrated that for certain could non Euclidean quadratic Algebra, algebraic rings this algorithm works and that's what it's it's this amazing thing when you, you sort of you you say that oh well you know I wish something would happen and right there and then somebody comes and says yes I mean your wish is granted uh, you know, I I was very impressed with them not with I, mean, I didn't do it so the first intermediate step which I missed I learned about this step which which is sort of very important but I just missed it because I was giving lecture 2004 and you know I don't track all the papers published in computer science probably understand why not uh, so I missed that one and uh, so there are two guys from University of Orhas in Denmark this is why my trip to Copenhagen was a very fortuitous at least for me because Orcas is actually very close to Copenhagen and they, they came to, to listen to my, 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 my lecture so they proved it that it worked for Eisenstein integers you might remember Eisenstein integers we talked about them these are integers generated by cubic roots of one the cyclic I mean the sort of if you take cubic roots of one they they generate some uh, grid on complex plane we we talked about it when we talked about work of Dedekind uh, and lo and behold apparently it works and what you need to do you need to take this remember this this is one of the cubic roots of one in spite of the fact that there's just a square root uh, it's a simple problem and mathematically inclined it's just a high school algebra should see why solving x cubed minus one could be reduced to solving a quadratic equation it's it's a really simple thing I should have put it as a problem uh, so if you take zeta equal to to this cubic root of one and generate uh, the corresponding integers uh, we could we could use Stein algorithm if we now start remember how we used one minus I for Gaussian 
if we start using 1 minus zeta, it will work. It apparently does. Oh, the, paper, the paper shows how it is done. And this Damgord, uh, my Danish is awful. So uh, it's something like Damgord. It's Damgord. I think Z is not pronounced. It's like Kirkegor or versus Kirkegard, but he's Gore actually. Kirkegor. Again, my Danish. You know, I have a very close friend who is a Dane. Some of you know that. And you know, every time I pronounce his name, he looks at me. Uh, because you know, there is this sing song in Danish, and I cannot do sing song. Bjarne Strustre. It's just not what I could do. So his wife cannot say it. So how could I? So so Dam Gore uh, and Franzen from Orchids did that. And then Franzen, this one of these two guys, with his student Agrawa, Agarwal, this is the guy who actually came to talk to me. They showed that the same algorithm works for integers generated by square root of minus 19. I say, who cares? Well, you see, if you go back into slides, back, 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 back from the last lecture, you will see that these were one of the bad things which destroyed the program of using Euclid to prove last Fermat theory. Because Euclid algorithm doesn't work for them. Guess what? Stein algorithm does. So now, of course, what is left? And this is this fascinating thing that we're almost there, except we cannot quite settle the case because, unlike Noether, who came up with the notion of Euclidean domain, we still do not know what is Stein's domain. We're tantalizingly close. Again, I close. We, you know, I have been asking this question when giving, uh, it's, not, it's not some, it's just sort of since 1997 or 96, I forget when I, the first time I gave this lecture. Uh, again, the, web, the website says when I first time. So what is Stein domain? What is the general setting of this output? And we're yay close, but no cigar. We're not done. So again, maybe one of you. You know, it's it's always it's always possible. Like a new sitting there pensively, maybe he'll just do it. Uh, okay, I need to explain. We're almost there. Let me explain a few things from ring theory, which we didn't cover in the beginning of the lecture. Of course, there's always method in my madness. I have to bring rings back. So let us, we already know what is unit is, yes? Unit is invertible element. So u is a unit if there is v such that v times u is 1. Now, let me tell you another definition from ring theory. Two elements of a ring are called associate elements if they differ by multiplying by unit. For example, what are associates of 5 in integers? N5 itself. Yeah. Two associates. Right? What are associates of 5 in Gaussian integers? For, yeah, yeah. There are four units. We multiply by four units. There are, f you know, four associates together. And by the way, there is a very simple thing which you should be able to prove, just like that, is that if I am Ryan's associate, he is my associate. Well, you see, units are invertible. So if Ryan is equal to me times a unit. We multiply me 
times the unit by inverse of the unit, which becomes just me and Ryan multiplied by inverse of the unit. So he becomes my associate. Associates are all together. Very, very simple. By the way, people who tell you math is complicated, no. Math is very simple when done properly. Yes? But with this, with inverse of a unit, we would have to require that multiplication is co 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 commutative. And you might have missed it. But I said that in this course from now on, all rings are commutative. Yes, we have to <laughs> require that. Yes. Uh, So I and all the all the guys, polynomials, Gaussian integers, all the guys we're talking about. I, this is commutative algebra now. So GCD, you don't do GCD of matrices. Just don't. Makes no sense now. So uh, and then very important notion. Notion of smallest prime. You say P is smallest prime. If there is no non-unit which is with smaller norm, right? it's smallest. It's just smallest. It's just that's how it is. Right? By the way, two is smallest prime. Do you agree? Oh, in integers, there's no smaller prime. Minus two is also smallest prime. In Gaussian integers, 2 is not smallest prime because 1 plus i, lo and behold, remember that we used 1 plus i as the, uh, uh, as 2, because it is actually smallest prime. By the way, what's the smallest prime? Let us look at polynomials. What are units of polynomials over reals? Non-zero free, I mean, free coefficients. Five is a unit. Seven is a unit. 1.3 is a unit in polynomials, right? Because you have all the, all the real numbers. You could multiply it by inverse of this real number, get one. What you cannot multiply by inverse of a real number, which is not a unit, which is smallest prime x is the smallest prime. You, know, you could divide everything else, and the remainder dividing by x is going to be a unit. Division by the smallest prime always gives a unit. Why? Because the remainder will give you either a unit or a smaller prime, or a smaller number then this number is not going to be a pr smallest pr pr prime, right? So this is, this is why there is this wonderful, wonderful thing that these were not accidents. Two was not there because computers decided to use two to implement them. Two works because it's the smallest prime of the corresponding ring. The same way as x, the same way as 1 plus i for Gaussian integers. And as for the same goes for other things we use for Eisenstein. They happen to be smallest primes. By the way, smallest prime usually is not unique. Smallest prime could be multiplied by a unit, and you get another smallest prime. For example, in Gaussian integers, 1 plus 1, 1 plus i is Smallest prime, what else is smallest prime? 1 minus i, minus 1 plus i, you know, all these four guys. They, they're four, four combinations, right? They all give us smallest primes. So these associates, and every number is sort of these four associates. Remember, that's very central. What, what's the norm? In for Gaussian integers? Uh, a squared plus B squared. So the norm is 2. Okay. Why is it 2 the smallest prime? 
because 2 is divisible by 1 plus i times 1 minus i. It's not prime. Prime is, cannot be divisible by two. Definition of a prime is that it has non-trivial divisor. But those aren't smaller. Yes, they are smaller. Yes, they are smaller. Look at the norm. What's the norm of one? These are very good questions. Thank you. Because the norm of one plus i is two. The norm of two is four. That's the, right. And in general, the, if you have A times B, the norm of A times B is norm of A times norm of B. So if a number has a prime norm, it's a prime for Gaussian integers, because then it just couldn't be decomposed. Right? This is why we know 2 is not a prime, because it doesn't have a prime norm. So. It's, it's a little tricky, so it's, I should have said that, my, my apologies. So, uh, and the same, so the, where, where was I? So, we have associates. So now, let us see few trivial things. If a Euclidean ring is not a field, it has the smallest prime. Why? Well, we keep decreasing the norm. Till, till we hit a prime. Eventually, since norm decreases, the one before we get, we get, get to one is going to be a prime. Then multiplication by unit does this. And if p is the smallest prime, that's the key one, then remainder of, di remainder of dividing something by smallest prime is either a unit or zero. It cannot be anything else. Because if it's anything else, we will get smaller prime. Right? Now, we're almost tantalizingly close to the genetic version of, of the algorithm. And I have the following conjecture. Again, I cannot quite prove it because my algorithm doesn't quite work. It works in a specific case. You, you will see that every Euclidean domain is a Stein domain. But we know that the opposite is not true. So there is a proper, proper inclusion. So let us look at generalized Stein algorithm. And I go the same four parts as before. So Stein GCD, again, the beginning is, this is all trivial. So, uh, amazing. So, uh, if, uh, if it's zero, then return the other one, right? Then just get the smallest prime, but we will not need it till the very end. So, this is why it needs to be moved. So, uh, then we do exactly as before. We divide by smallest prime whatever the smallest prime, and we increment the counter. So how many times we divide it by whatever it is? One plus i. We, we keep, you know, it's exactly the same. And then, it's again, we somehow, now, we do not check, we used to check m is equal n. You see, we live in a much harder world right now. You know, they, they couldn't be quite equal. You could have one and i, and you need to stop. So you need to figure out that they're not associates, right? That they're not equivalent to multiplying by unit. So we need this operation, this associate. Then we check the norm and swap them. And then there is this mysterious separation, which I cannot name, but I cannot quite define axiomatically. Reduce associate remainders. That is, I need to be able to take these two guys, which right now are not divisible by smallest prime, multiply them by unit. We know that both of them have non-zero remainders divided 
when divided by smallest prime, right? Because we factored out all smallest primes, so remainders are not zero. We know that these remainders are units. Do we know that? Yeah, because nothing else. It's either zero or unit. We proved that. Now, this is a wonderful thing. We know that units constitute a multiplicative group. That is, we could make always multiply one by some unit to make, to make them equal. And then we cancel them. But there are different ways. Remember what we had with, there could be different ways of canceling. We could multiply one by some unit and another, and only one of this canceling might reduce the norm. And even that, I do not know how to quite make formal. So this is the last remaining thing is to sort of figure out the semantics of that guy. But we're, what I claim is that we're tantalizingly close to sort of understanding the abstract setting of in a very different way from, from Euclid of, 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 this, of this problem. And again, it's sort of, I love this smallest prime thing. It's just something fundamental about it. It's not, it's not a random, it's not a heck, if you like. It's good. And then finally, it's very simple. We raise our smallest prime. It's the first time we need it. This is why we need to move into this. And uh, we raise it to minimum of these two things. And remember power from the first journey? It comes back, so we raise it. This is like shift, unless we have a faster way, unless we have left shift, which we might. But if we don't, we still could just use power and multiply m by that. And we get this fully generic Stein GCD. So, um, in previous slides, uh, do we need to accumulate d underscore m? On this slide, yes. No, not here. As the same as with Stein. From that point on, they, you know, they, they never present in both. I mean, we factor them out in the beginning. All the joint x's or 1 plus i's, no, we don't. So this is, this is exactly the same code as non-generic version. But yeah, so in, probably in the generic version as well? Yeah, yeah. No, we don't have the same problem. OK, so why do you need this code in this case? I don't know, because you need to reduce. You need to get to m. This is like the cascade of minuses, basically. No. This is the cascade of minuses and shifts to equalize them. Otherwise, they, they're not equal. So that's what makes them equal. There are two, two things. You factor out two, and then you make whatever them equal. So, so this, this is the same here. All right? So, of course I'm using it in retained thing. M. M. It's exactly the same. There is no difference between generic and non-generic code, except sort of replacing some. The logic is the same. I should put spaces in. I always put spaces in, and why this is this is why you didn't see it. Okay, Brian. <laughs> I mean, he still could remember his name, unlike me. So, the conclusion of all: What are the lessons? So, first, that this is to me this story is utterly fascinating. That what Joseph Stein did shows shows us this wonderful, he bravely attacked a classical problem. And so should we, in a sense. If all the textbooks tell you that sorting is n log n, you sort of say, well, of course sorting is n log n. Maybe not in your application. Right? Sort of keep an open mind. And if you manage to sort in linear time, try to figure out why. Because obviously, the the n log n bound is correct. 
It's not that you defeated old mathematics. You just discovered some profound condition on your stuff, on your problem. So this, this is basically something which we should always remember. That yes, we should sort of, great mathematicians are so greater than us, no question about it. But we should still bravely attack problems on which they work. Sort of this is, and again, you know, my letter exchange with, with Stein, sort of, the guy has amazing humility. He's just a, such a wonderful guy. This is why he bravely attacked it. It wasn't an arrogance that, oh, I don't care about them. It was just, I need to solve this problem. Let us see if I could find faster solutions. Because he had constraints. And again, constraints are good for creativity. There is this modern idea, a vile idea, that creative means having no constraints. No, Mozart was creative precisely because he obeyed infinitely many self-imposed constraints. Right? So constraints are good, right? sort of practical constraints. Not enough storage, not enough CPU time, sort of whatever, whatever management comes up with is actually good. Right? And then sort of the, the final lesson is that there are no hacks. If there is an optimization, if something improves the algorithm, there is probably something deep which needs to be identified. And obviously you could miss it. I'm not saying, oh, I could miss it. I probably miss most of it, but there is always something deep. You know, there is something. This is why I wanted to bring Stein algorithm into, into the story. And it is a neat algorithm also. So, and you might need rational numbers one day. So, see you next week. <laughs>